And I'm Damian Wetzel, Director of Aspen Institute Arts Program, and welcome to our roundtable uh, with Halcyon. Uh, please welcome Kate Goodall. Hello. Sam Pressler. Sheldon and Yoko, and we're going to get into an entire discussion, but we're going to keep it free form today, we've decided. And we're going to have questions starting around 1 o'clock. And for first, let's just sit down, and we're just going to start. Awesome. Um, Kate, the inspiration for this discussion is, is the inspiration of Halcyon, mm. about what it does uh, with its incubator project and its arts fellows and so many other things. So I thought we should start by you framing that for this audience. I know there's Absolutely. quite a few people here who already know some things about Halcyon, but I know there's a lot who really don't know anything I think the about inspiration it. was just that yeah. I wanted to spend more time with you, Damien. But um, uh, no, I think uh, victory. We were to <laughs> victory. We were we were talking and, and uh, you know specifically around Halcyon's work and this topic came up as something that we thought might be really interesting to explore and that everyone here might be interested to learn a little bit more about. Um, for those who are unaware, Halcyon's mission is uh, to catalyze emerging creatives who are striving for a better world. And when we say the word creative, we really mean anyone who's taking anything from zero to one, a blank sheet of paper, to something of substance. So we have um, a business incubator for social entrepreneurs um, and those are people that are creating new businesses that have a social impact. So they're affecting um, a different uh, societal problem or challenge in healthcare, clean energy, education, you name it. Um, so it really is you name it? It really is you name it. We, we decided to be very agnostic about sector. Uh, and that was met with some skepticism at first. But the great thing is when you create a cohort of people who are not all focused in the same area, then they're less likely to compete with each other and more likely to collaborate, which is, I think, a good part of the secret source that goes into Halcyon is that that collaboration within the cohort of, of creatives. Mm -hmm. um, so we launched the Incubator in 2014, uh, and then we launched an arts lab with a very similar methodology, helping artists who were interested in social change and social justice in 2017. Both programs very uniquely provide them a free place to live, which is quite a big deal for many in a very expensive city, um, and I think really helps to disrupt the status quo of who gets to consider this, because it, it's quite risky to drop everything and pursue an idea. Um, it, we give mentorship, we give a stipend, um, and most importantly, I think we're building a community. I also say we're building a very kind army from time to time, a kind army, <laughs> a kind army. Uh, you know, just a, a, a group of very mission-driven, mm -hmm. thoughtful, resilient, brilliant people um, who now have each other, right? And that's sort of the, the beauty of it at, at its core is when you have an idea like, I'm going to um, innovate the education system, you know, People say, oh, great, I'll help. No, they don't say that. <laughs> they, they, no, uh, no, they don't. They, you're generally no. first met with, with some skepticism. Um, and so if we've done our job at Halcyon, we have created a space where instead we say, OK, how can we help? Um, so that's the perfect segue to the exemplars of these programs you just mentioned. So maybe, would you, would you do the honors? So maybe we can start with Sheldon Scott, and you can tell us a little bit about Sheldon, and then Sheldon, you can tell us what this is, is this, is this how this framework's working for you? Sure. We'll go from there. I think maybe I'll just say that all three, Sam, Yoko, and Sheldon, are all um, you know, working on problems that uh, impact enormous systems. And you'll hear from mm -hmm. them. I think it's better to let them tell their stories. But um, I'm not sure who's got it harder, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sheldon is, is affecting systemic problems in education. Yoko is working uh, with healthcare to create better wellness outcomes in hospitals. And, and Sam is working to provide community for, for veterans um, and affect some of the change that's needed there. So. Sheldon, small, do you want to? Small, 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 <laughs> small, yeah. small things. Yes, OK. Yeah, sure. Um, so the project I'm working on is looking at pedagogy and bias in early childhood and early elementary education through performance and visual arts, and then creating an anti-bias curriculum for pre-K three to third grade that empowers teachers to detect and teach through bias in existing classroom material. OK. Sounds good. Exactly. <laughs> okay. 
Um, and it or the problem is? So the problem is, um, you know, as a, as a performance and visual artist, um, I started on a body of work uh, back in 2014 that looked at the myth and legend of American blackness through story, song, and riddle. Mm -hmm. And what I was really interested in um, kind of finding out or exploring is the power of American mythology um, and, um, you know, coming through it as a former psychotherapist, actually thinking hypothetically that in greatest moments of fear, we go to the information that we're most comfortable with and believing that the information that we're most comfortable with is the information that we've known the longest. So it was not about just what we learn, but also how critically important it is to examine when we learn. And, um, you know, let's, it really was looking it through the lens of police officers who were um, who had murdered black bodies, and thinking about the mythology that inspired the their responses that overtook every bit of training, and um, you know and, and knowledge and skill building that they ever had that overpowered that and what really drove them to react the way that they did, mm. and I just um, looked at this story called uh, John Henry. And the story of John Henry, uh, born a man, born with two hammers in his hand. And um, when I started to read that story, like through and through, and listen to the songs, and you know, it's a, it's one of those stories that appear in many different forms. Mm -hmm. And you know, these are all things that we teach our children. And in that, I immediately saw the mythology of the black male supernatural body, and what it means to rob black boys of childhood, and the um, the real life consequences based on that. So um, after getting some, um, uh, some critical response to the work in 2014, I just like looking for an opportunity to like explore this a little bit deeper and maybe talk about um, broader matters, including um, race, gender, gender expression, and ability and disability. And um, Halcyon came on and it was just like the perfect opportunity for me to take, which was then an exclusively fine art practice and put it in a social practice um, kind of experiment and like you know Kate said like Halcyon really did provide that um, safe and unwavered space to be able to do that which is quite a rarity mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. is he here <laughs> this might change the nature of my we talk work we, we got a few more things to say we have some more to do uh, so that's a very. Did we have? We're going to come back to that actually. Sure. All right. <laughs> about Halcyon itself and the ownership of voice and yes. the promotion of voice. We want to talk about that in different contexts. But so that's that's a slice of it. And I think we're. I want to come back in a minute after we've we've heard from Yoko and Sam, and think about like a, a specific you know remedy that has the fine art practice morphs into the social practice about what that looks like. I think that'd be interesting for people to grab onto. Um, Yoko. Yes, so our work currently focuses on transforming the sound environment in hospitals. Um, I am an ambient electronic musician, so um, I make music on computer, but I was classically trained with piano, so that's my background. And for nearly 10 years, that's really all I did. I compose, produce music, I do performance, I collaborate with other artists, I do gallery installations, I license my music to places. <coughs> then I got sick several years ago and I had to spend a long time in hospitals. And I'm a musician, so I'm sensitive to sound. And I was really <coughs> disturbed by the noise in hospitals. How, how many of you here have ever been to a hospital? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you remember what you heard? Mm -hmm. Like in ICU, emergency room, all the beeps and People are screaming and cards rolling and cold blue. It's just crazy. And, you know, some people say hearing is the last sense to go when we die. So I used to wonder what's the last sound I get to hear at the end of my life. 
Is it the beep sound? <laughs> like it's it's tragic, right? And as a sound artist, I just thought that's unacceptable. It's like in I think when we read about Steve Jobs and he was you know sick in his later life and he was in a hospital, and somebody was trying to bring him this oxygen mask, and he was kind of a, you know half conscious. But he got up and said, that oxygen mask is so ugly. I'm not going to put that in my face. <laughs> if I had, you know, a few more years to live, I'm definitely changing the design of healthcare. And it's one of those, you know, moments for sound artists that this is not acceptable. And, and I got lucky and I got better. And... When you go through an experience of a uh, illness and and you feel like okay my life is kind of stuck here and that's it to wow I, I I actually have years to live now it's like you got a bonus and oh I should do something mm -hmm. you know with this kind of spare life and at first I thought well maybe I could do some uh, artistic project to let people know about this issue and I applied to Halcyon and I got in. And that's when I realized, and that was the time before arts program was in place. The only program I could apply was for social entrepreneurship program. And I realized, oh, now I have to change it. And I like, not just <laughs> that project. <laughs> so since then, we have worked with uh, different hospitals. Uh, we have a residency innovation partnership with uh, Sibri Memorial Hospitals Innovation Center. We have worked with uh, device companies to uh, already redesign some of the alarm sounds that's used in hospital. And um, we are working with uh, palliative care initiatives. We are working with children, a bunch of things. Uh, so it's been really exciting. And I'd say that without Halcyon, none of what I'm doing today is, is really happening. So uh, this was really a major part of what's happening right now for me. So, yeah. Terrific. OK. So we've, we're tackling education and healthcare, and now Sam, take us where, where, your, where your work is going. Tough acts to follow. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Sam Pressler. Um, I, I'm the executive director of an organization called the Armed Services Arts Partnership, or ASAP. Um, at a high level, our mission is to uh, help reintegrate veterans, uh, service members, and military families into their communities through the arts. Um, what does that mean in a practical sense? Uh, well, we kind of look at our work in two levels, right? We're, we're looking at a challenge that uh, when veterans, uh, you know, when service members leave the military, they're faced with, with this, you know, absence of kind of social support that you had so strong when you were in the military, this absence of purpose, that mission that you had when you were in the military, and questions about who am I now, what's next. Um, on the other side, we realize that uh, less than 1% of the population have served at any given time since 9-11. So you have a growing disconnect uh, between those who've served and those who haven't, and it manifests culturally, socially, and, and actually very much geographically in where people live. Um, so where, you know, where does our programming come in? Where does the arts come in? Um, we're really focused not on fixing what's broken, but you know, building skills, uh, providing a place for veterans and their families to hone their stories and express themselves, and really build that community through ongoing artistic engagement. Um, we do classes uh, in stand-up comedy. Uh, we run uh, the first stand-up comedy class in the country for veterans, according to Google. Um, <laughs> it's because I said in an interview and on panels, and now it's on Google. Um, so don't trust the internet. Um, uh, we also do an improv comedy class. We do storytelling. We do creative writing. And then we um, do a variety of workshops. So we work with organizations like Woolly Mammoth, who's in the room, woo -woo, uh, to do uh, workshops with their teaching artists who, who may come through. We work with uh, local museums and arts organizations to deliver uh, a variety of workshops. Um, and we offer performances. And, and for us, performances are a really powerful platform because it provides our veterans with a really non-stigmatized and very accessible avenue to share their stories, but also allows us to invite people in who may not have as much exposure to that experience to listen and ideally walk away with a broader understanding of the veteran military experience. Um, so that's what we do kind of in the direct service level. 
but there's also, we kind of talk about the systemic piece, um, yeah. and I'm sure we'll get into it more deeply, but for us, we're, also, we're looking at a situation where for veterans, we have, uh, with the arts, we have a lot of the resources that we already need, right? We have folks who are entering their communities. We know that, uh, we know resources at the VA, the DOD, Veterans Service Organizations, and we have amazing arts organizations and teaching artists who have the skill set to, uh, to provide these services, but what we're missing is kind of the overlap between the two. Uh, and so where we come in is we are, you know, A, an intermediary, so we're coordinating, we're providing, uh, you know, that trusted, that trusted uh, intermediary to the veteran organizations, to the DOD, to refer veterans to these arts programs. Um, we get about three to five times demand for our programs as we have space right now, so we're starting to do a good job around that. Uh, we're a trainer, so we train teaching artists to deliver um, their classes in a way that is trauma aware and culturally competent so that they understand their scope of practice. They're not doing art therapy when it's a really art education intervention and they understand how to uh, react when crises may arise in the classroom. Um, and then we're very much focused on program evaluation and advancing the literature base because you know one of the things that we run into in arts and health is that there's just there's limited sample sizes, there's limited research. So how as a program that is starting to scale can we you know, leverage that sample size and really learn so that we can kind of proliferate this knowledge and, and go in places where we may not ever be able to serve. So it's kind of what we've been up to. We're three years old and still trying to figure stuff out. But And the work at Halcyon, so yeah, you're sorry. specific. Uh, yeah, so just yeah, so I was in the same class as Yoko. We were the two uh, resident arts people. Um, <laughs> She's an artist, I'm just some guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I really like it. <laughs> I'm not. Um, so <laughs> Halcyon came in, similarly, uh, I, had, I graduated college in 2015. Um, and You're moving slowly. Yeah, and I got a fellowship from the Echoing Green Foundation like two weeks after I graduated college. And so I'm like, oh, I'm starting a nonprofit now. Um, and at, first of all, I didn't know how to be an adult. Um, <laughs> I didn't know how to be an employee. And then on top of that, I didn't know how to run a nonprofit in this weird intersectional space. Uh, so Halcyon really came in and they didn't teach me how to be an adult. My girlfriend did that. But um, <laughs> Halcyon came in and I think provide us, uh, the most valuable thing for me was um, the peer resources, so having someone like Yoko that I could just go, you were right next to me on my desk, I apologize for how messy my desk was, but you go to Yoko and I, you, you can kind of brainstorm these challenges you're having, but also you know, support from advisors and mentors. So um, someone who I still meet with on a monthly basis is my leadership coach from Halcyon, and, and that for me, you know, I didn't know how to be an adult or anything like that. She came in and provided me with um, kind of resources in, in, a, in a toolbox that I could use to take on this responsibility that I didn't realize Did what I signed up Wendy? for. Wendy? Wendy, yeah. Yeah, she's still my leadership coach. Too. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Still she's aspiring great. to be like Kate. She's but. great. <laughs> she's awesome. Yeah. Um, well, why don't you expand a little bit on the structure that you're providing? Okay, that idea of the mentorship and what yeah, and so beyond, no. like, we can all kind of imagine, okay, you're going to get a place to live. Actually, that's just that, that alone, uh, enormous. But, you know, and the idea of a space to work in and maybe some collaboration, but it sounds like there's a lot more than that going on. Um, and I'll try my best not to make it just a long list, right? So it really breaks down into three things when I explain what Halcyon does. We provide community, space, and access. So if you look at the space component, we provide the physical space, which, as I mentioned, you know, is, is very helpful to many people. You know, many of our fellows... Um, you know, would be just as successful. They have parents they can live with. They, mm -hmm. you know, have access to networks. They'd be fine. But there are uh, some of our fellows for whom that space is actually a very critical component um, uh, and really helps with their affordability of, of living. Um, there's another element to the space piece, which is kind of headspace, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, we strive to allow for people to really think bigger. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're in an inspirational setting. They're um, hopefully their needs are taken care of. They have a stipend. Mm -hmm. They you know they have um, people around that they can pull from. Um, and that headspace, uh, in order to think as big as you possibly can and 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 um, move forward on. Uh, creating an organization or attacking a problem is um, really something that we are uh, very cognizant of. 
So there's the space piece, and within that, they, as I mentioned, they get this cash stipend, they get a place to live. At the Arts Lab, they get a studio space, um, and at Halcyon, they get office space. Um, the community aspect is, you know, as Sam hit on, we, everyone gets a mentor, but they also get a leadership coach. Because your mentor is meant to be your gateway to the, the networks that you're going to need and some critical strategic feedback. But you don't want to go to that person and sort of admit your failings, right? <laughs> so that's really where the leadership coach comes in. And for different people, it means different things. Sometimes they're really helping you be a better leader. You know, in, in more, more urgent cases, they're maybe helping you, um, uh, you know, just be a sounding board for you because you're having a very emotionally difficult week. Um, being an entrepreneur or an artist, I think, means weathering ups and downs uh, emotionally that can be um, extraordinarily jarring. And, and uh, you have to face a lot of demons, right, um, in order to be successful. So the leadership coaches are really um, amazing part um, of what we provide. For the, arts, for the artists, it's more sort of like group leadership coaching and that the... the um, uh, incubator right now, they get an individual person. Um, and then uh, the access component. This is really, um, uh, you know, where as we grow, we want to become more and more successful. Many of them are working on, as you heard, these systemic challenges, and they need to be able to um, pull policy levers, and uh, they're really scaling kind of federal or global solutions, some of them more than even uh, just businesses, um, and to be able to access people with the right knowledge who um, can help them advance those in the, the way that they could be as big and as impactful as possible, but also creating an on-ramp for those people to find the solutions and the innovators that they need. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's really the final piece of, of the work. And everything that they get breaks down into one of those three buckets. How much, um, I mean, how much advice goes on, I'm wondering? Too much. Because, <laughs> <laughs> too much. <laughs> no, it's, it becomes, I think, uh, you guys should chime in, but it becomes an exercise sometimes in listening to, deciding whose advice to listen to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? Sorry. Yeah. Let's cycle back to, to Sheldon. Maybe, uh, how about, can we talk a little bit about specific examples? Uh, of, of interventions that you're working on right now? Yeah, so, you know, through, I think, like the kind of force feel that is Halcyon, I've been able to like do a deep dive into exploring um, some of these ideas um, that exist in the classroom. And right now we're, um, we're doing a read um, in a week or so and in part of the research for this project, we've been looking at uh, recommended reading lists um, through a couple of different school districts. And you know, Washington DC is a bubble. So um, you know, accessing Washington DC's reading lists, you know, wasn't exactly what we were interested in exploring. You know, because um, I often tell people that I am a casualty of the South Carolina public school system. I was born and raised in Pauley's Island, South Carolina. And you know, people try to push back on that. And I said, you know, well, if you look at some of the accomplishments that I have, I own those as being in spite of you know my educational experience, not because of. And um, so we're doing this read and looking um, into these three levels of bias. And um, the thing that we're very focused on exploring right now is my project, as opposed to these two. I'm still in the project now, yeah. so I'm still we're about halfway done, a little over halfway. Um, we're looking at Shell Silverstein's The Giving Tree. Mm -hmm and um, exploring that as the basis for rape culture. Um, so it's been one of those opportunities, I think, where Kate mentioned about like having pushback, and you know, people mm -hmm. love Shel Silverstein. Yeah. And like, when you take an icon like that and you start to break it down, people are like, oh my god, what are you doing? And um, because people are looking for much more obvious ways, but the, yeah. the, again, this is the innocuous pieces of work. So we took that piece of work and then we broke it down, we put it in a group setting, we did an actual reading, and we asked people to just like kind of close their eyes and envision a story where this um, there's two engendered characters, this boy who gets referred to as a boy throughout his entire life, no matter how he ages, and the woman that was a tree. Mm -hmm. And the idea of like this inequitable environment mm -hmm. where the boy just takes, 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 and then never gives anything in return to the tree. 
And um, so that was, I think, one of we used that example with a group of teachers, uh -huh. stakeholders, and parents. And that is our first new exploration in this piece. And then out of that piece, then will come the performance artwork that will then um, help to take some of the deepest and dirtiest um, parts of that narrative uh -huh. and put it in a way that makes it much more palatable. So when people did, did anyone ever feel icky after reading that book? <laughs> Some people do, <laughs> and it's usually people who are um, a little bit more contemporary. Mm -hmm. Like those are the ones like I always hated that book, but I had no idea. But then like there's a larger population who's like, oh my god, Shel Silverstein, it's okay. I used to love that book, and then now they don't love it so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I think that's one of the clearest example of something that has emerged out of this like very particular um, Halcyon experience. I'm still exploring. And that's um, just just from calling the reading too. lists and you've just, you know, you pick some specific things to, to do, to work on. And, Absolutely. And that would be one of them. That, that, I think that's the clearest example for right now. Makes perfect sense. Um, so we had a conversation right off the bat about, you know, atmospheric sound. Uh, and I'm obviously very invested in that as a, as, as, as a dancer, producer. Everything is about, you know, what we can, what we experience. And I was commenting that in our new space here, this is my first time in this magnificent new Aspen Institute space, I said, um, we should talk about what it sounds like. And you immediately said, yes, I'm hearing the air conditioners. And, I'm hearing. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yes, you are. It's all true. But when you take it to a level of concern about the, the health process, and then you're taking it one step further, in my mind, to the human process, the idea of what is the last sound, or perhaps the first sound you hear. Um, how, how is your work progressing on this? Maybe something specific. You mentioned some of the, the work going on at Sibley, for instance, or, you know, what, is, what does it sound like? Definitely, definitely. So, um, it's interesting because you are a dancer, and I worked with dancers also, and how sound is something that, that we often take for granted. Mm -hmm. And it has a way of affecting our emotions, behaviors, and perception. And it's, it's also a public sort of a canvas, because in this space, everybody has to kind of hear the sound that, or lack of sound. And it's just sort of a one area as a society. Um, most people identify themselves as a visually oriented people and sound is something that's often overlooked and even the language true? I used overlooked is a visual language. Let's do a quick survey. Would you identify yourself as visually oriented? Sound oriented? Less so. Interesting. Interesting. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah so in our line of work Oftentimes, you know, people make an assumption, you're a musician, so you go to a hospital and put your music there, that's nice. And that's <laughs> tempting, but that's actually, you know, not what we have done so far. I believe in the human-centered process, and it's not about putting my what I believe to be the best solution to the place, or like you said, fixing mm -hmm. the issue. I don't think people want things to be fixed. People need to be listened to. <laughs> people have needs. Yeah. They have, th and people in the healthcare space already know the issue, and they just need support of of somebody. So in a way, I'm using my expertise. Uh, my sensibility is for the sound as a way to, to make intervention. And for the specific example, with Sibley Memorial Hospital, we spent uh, six months just on the research to understand how sound impacts people's emotion, experience, and behaviors. And we ask people questions like, walk me through all the sounds you hear, you know, in this space. What is most disturbing to you? Um, and we realized that a lot of people complain about alarms, but people also complain about, you know, people talking, um, cards are rolling, like behavior-based noise. Mm -hmm. So for the alarm part, 
we really need a systemic change because there is a regulation that actually decides what kind of tones we are allowed to use. So we are working with people who are in the regulatory committee uh, in Europe. Uh, we are working with leading researchers who do product design to alarm fatigue studies to understand what types of sounds will be uh, more soothing. Uh, in terms of Sibley, we created this uh, immersive relaxation experience we call Tranquility Room for staff members to be able to come and take a break. Uh, oftentimes, we tend to focus on patient experience, and that's how hospitals get reimbursement, and I'm a patient. No one is looking into the well-being of healthcare staff, nurses. And if we take care of the people who take care of people, we can immediately improve the experience for everybody. So we decided our intervention area should be first focused on staff members. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the examples. Wow. Yeah. I know um, I visited the Cleveland Clinic a couple of years ago, which has been doing some extraordinary work around visual art as well as you know, just trying to integrate that uh, focus as an experience throughout the, the facility. And they talked a lot about uh, the influence they could have on the families. Right. Very specific, right. as opposed to just the experience that they have and how that affects the patients very specifically. I imagine that's, uh, that's, that's coming as well. But you're starting, in your mind, focusing more heavily on the staffing. Right. Right. And the families, we also work for pediatric experience and especially for children's hospital, family experience, parents, it, it, it really, really matters. Yeah. Wow, wonderful. Yeah. We were talking out there about, um, you know, sometimes it can be difficult to be accepted as someone who is allowed to work in this system because your experience is in a different system. And that sort of generalization or taking a leap from, you know, uh, dance to running an arts program mm -hmm. is, uh, is sometimes, you know, uh, frowned upon or people, people struggle with it. But, um, you know, I think both Yoko and Sheldon are really great examples of how the artist can be a disruptor Mm -hmm. And there is a power in them, in them coming into a system um, and initiating change that would be a lot harder, perhaps, from someone who is already working within mm -hmm. the system. And to use their, their, their ability to be artists, to be shapeshifter, mm -hmm. to come in and shine a light on a problem and then obviously initiate some reflection on that problem mm -hmm. through the practices that they know from, as an artist. I mean, it's so much about, you know, all of this is about making change of various kinds and finding a way to, to bring everybody along. And your, your you know, articulation of it is actually about listening, not you telling them. You know, it's, of course, like very steeped in a design theory kind of mentality that you actually we're going to find that together. Mm. Uh, but that's a very tough proposition when things are entrenched and we deal with regulations. And... Perhaps, I mean, one of the sectors, I mean, Sam, the military sector, in my limited experience with people, we mentioned uh, Arthur Bloom and Music Corps, but also thinking about Brian Derry's and Theater of War and some of the other uh, arts institutions or organizations that are really trying to make inroads into providing services uh, for veterans specifically. I have observed that the, the military structure is actually eager in a way that other structures are not so eager. Is that mm -hmm. is that a, is that right? Like the, you know, eager they are to eager, eager to, to to take advantage of things that are working. To say, mm -hmm. hey, oh, that is a that is that does work. And yeah. So we're going to do that. And I think, like, if we take a historical perspective on this, right, like the advent of music and art therapy came uh, following World War II, when when mm -hmm. we were able to do that work through the VA and, and through the military. So the unique value and um, you know, place in which veterans sit uh, and military sits today is that, generally speaking, there is public support for for veterans when they return. We're not in the post Vietnam era where it's more polarized. So what that means is we can be at the vanguard of some of these things. We can be learning about mm -hmm. the impact of community arts, not just on veterans but on other 
populations, whether that be formerly incarcerated people, um, whether that be individuals who uh, experience trauma, or just adults in general, because as adults we don't have that much fun, um, right? Yeah. We can learn about that through veterans because there is an interest, um, for better or for worse, there's a lot of funding, uh, at least uh, in the federal government for this work. And so whether it's top down, you know, through DOD and the VA's programming and the arts or bottom up with community programming, at least my hope and what like really gets me excited is not just the direct impact on veterans and their families, but how can this eventually be translatable? Uh, and so that's how mm -hmm. I interpreted your question. And I think- mm -hmm. um, Well done, yeah, yeah. fine, yeah. And, and from a Halcyon point of view, how much, uh, do you demand of them? I'm curious. Oh, <laughs> they should probably answer that. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. We we uh, we have structure mm -hmm. built around their time, right? So, um, for the entrepreneurs, they they get five months to live with us, and at the beginning of that time, they sort of debut mm -hmm. to everyone at an event, including press and and. We work with them ahead of time, particularly those who haven't had media training or, you know, practice in 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 refining their talking points on how to do that. Um, and then there's a skill series, you know, for for classes for how you can measure your impact, negotiate, um, uh, raise money, etc. Along the way, and then at the end, there's um, uh, another sort of debut for for the um, those at the incubator to do their final pitch to donors or investors. Um, and that is helpful to kind of drive people along to a goal, but it also injects stress, you know. Um, and we, you know, try to be mindful of the balance of the help and the stress. Um, but these guys also induce their own stress. I mean, if you're not careful, they all work 23 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So we also have, you know, yoga classes from time to time and just mm -hmm. try to get people away from their computers. And um, at the Arts Lab, they get a little longer. They get nine months with us. Um, but I know, you know, the, the leader of that program, Nicole, who I think is here. Um, mm -hmm. There you are. Um, you know, is really mindful about making sure that they have a balance of, you know, studio visits, criticism, um, you know, help on their uh, their work, but also studio time. Mm -hmm. And how do you give people a space to retreat? Um, and so just, it's, it's actually complicated. I it's mean, so complicated. I have spent, I, I have a lot of opportunity to give artists in residence programs and various things that I'm involved in. And regulating their time and, and the demands on it or, you know, the pressures, as you said, that come in that and sometimes, you know, to detriment are very difficult. Yeah. yeah. And what if you like to work at 3 a.m.? I mm -hmm. mean, there's, you know, you've got to, you have to, you can't be rigid. Mm -hmm. um, so you've built that flexibility. Yeah, we certainly try. So before we open up for questions, maybe we'll talk a little bit about the idea of, uh, we, we started outside a little bit about owning voice of a sort as an organization. And I think there are a lot of people in the room who have opportunities, and I hope you're inspired to think about, oh, how could I foster, you know, an incubate an idea in an effective way in my practice, in my organization. Um, and you have a board, you have uh, responsibilities as the co-founder and all of these things. How do you handle that idea um, right now in this, you know, very difficult environment that uh, yeah. we're living in politically? Uh, with trepidation. Mm -hmm. trepidation. <laughs> no, I think you know we um, we really try to uh, create an environment for the most brilliant people, and I think you'll all agree these are some brilliant people um, to uh, own their own voice, and you know they need to synthesize different pieces of advice, sometimes a cacophony of advice, and choose what they're going to do, mm -hmm. make their own choices, and, and find their own voice. Mm -hmm. um, and we hope that we are helpful in that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I my work is making sure that my board knows everything that they're doing, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, is prepared with talking points to be in support of that. And so the stance that we take is, we support their work mm -hmm. um, and their uh, right to express themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, we are, you know, we're hands off. Mm -hmm. But it's, a, it, it's, it's interesting, Damien. 
I'd love to hear your take on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, you know, rightly or wrongly, so no judgment intended uh, on anybody or in past experiences that have happened, just in the abstract, fostering progress is thorny. And to be responsible for an institution that is fostering thorniness has a, has a, 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 a a dynamic, and I find that you've threaded the needle beautifully. In a sense, it's like you're you're giving the publicly space. at publicly. three a.m. I wake up in a cold sweat. But. <laughs> but I think it's really important to be able to take take a stance throughout that you are not the voice, but you are the place that you're 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 creating a, a, an amplification system. Right. And then be able to step back. Because you will get those 3 a.m. calls that say, wait, are you backing this? Right. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, in a sense, you absolutely are. But it's, it's, it's a bigger project that you're backing, I think. Does absolutely. Does that make sense? You no, know, that's, that's very true. Um, you know, I think that our challenge in this day and age is giving people the space to hear each other mm -hmm. and find connection mm -hmm. so that they can hear each other. That's right. You know, the, all of their work is very much working across systems, bringing together people from, with different languages, different backgrounds, different biases, and synthesizing them. So all of these guys understand that inherently. And, and from Halcyon's perspective, you know, we're working across different sectors as well. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, in, in a very public way, um, you know, needing to ensure that we're leaving the space for different voices. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's trickier and trickier these days, you know, to, to um, be patient with each other, but I think more and more important, mm -hmm. right? It's, yeah. Okay, so we're going to go to questions uh, from the house. I think we do have microphones around, uh, and they're going to come to you. Uh, and we'll start right here because uh, Joanne has her hand raised so high. Uh, <laughs> there's a microphone on its way. Yeah. Well, thank you. I adore Halcyon as I do the art lab here. Two questions, if you don't mind. I'm curious about with each new crop of fellows, how do you identify your your leaders that you are using for mentoring, or how do you identify the levels of um, the outsiders who do perform the mentoring and or become the uh, identified leader? And for you, uh, Oko, uh, Yoko, excuse me, I was. Uh, wondering whether you have made your pitch to any major insurance company to try to get them to buy into you know what you're doing and I relate to it very much so given what I tried to get Georgetown to change some things when I was there okay so two questions okay. one about the structure about how yeah. you how you do that but then specific for Yoko so um, for their leadership coaches actually we have this amazing woman Wendy Luke who is a leadership coach herself and she um, interviews each person and selects a leadership coach. They all do it pro bono. Wendy herself takes, you know, one fellow, and it's uh, it's and it's incredible. I'm so grateful to her. Um, the mentorship program is is starts with a similar select uh, sort of um, deep dive on not only what the fellow is trying to achieve, but the type of person that they are. You know, because we learned early on when our mentorship with our first cohort, when I'll be brutally honest, our mentorship program was about 50% successful. We had to rematch like half the cohort. And we, we learned it's because we had just matched people with experts in the field that they're working in, but we hadn't examined if those people might actually work from a chemistry standpoint. Um, you know, it, it, it does you no good to get the expert in a field if they are intolerant of somebody learning um, or they don't have the time or you know anything like that I'd much rather have someone who is you know not quite as polished but but is patient and and um, generous and you won't be looking for any sharp pain types that doesn't no no we don't we don't do that Yoko you want to think about the insurance question for a minute maybe that's just a yes or no answer but is that of interest <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's an interesting point. I actually have been in touch with uh, somebody, and, and I haven't necessarily made a pitch, per se, but uh, to your question, and I think it's similar in both of your cases, that um, what we do 
is no, like it involves stakeholders from almost every element of the sector, and there is no exception. When it comes to something like sound, I consider this a symptom of the larger cultural issue that healthcare is designed to be disease-centered mode. That's really mm. the issue, and sound is a symptom of that. So through mm. the exploration, every element of healthcare comes up. And when I ask people about sound, they don't stop talking about sound. And they start to talk about what it means to be sick and how it was so difficult to talk to insurance company to get investment. Stories just come out. So that's definitely one of the uh, stakeholders I would be interested in exploring <laughs> in the near future. <laughs> In the back. Hi, uh, thanks so much. My name is Clay Lord. I'm with Americans for the Arts. Um, and, and Kate, you talked about um, the sort of cross-sector nature of a lot of this. Um, and that's something that we, we work on a lot. And one of the things that we find is, is sort of endlessly challenging, which you also referenced, is the differentiated vocabularies and sort of expectations and starting points between the creative sector and whatever the other sector is, whether it's health and wellness or the military or whatever. So I guess uh, for, for you, I'm wondering um, how much uh, innate experience do your fellows and other folks that you sort of bring into the program have at the start with that? Are they, are they generally sort of good at that to start or is there a lot of training that goes into that? And then from the three of you, I'm wondering if you have um, uh, examples of, of ways where you have used the training from Halcyon in order to, to kind of pursue these objectives you have in the military space or in the health space or in the equity space or, or, or so on in education? Thank you. That's such a good question. Um, you know, I think, it, again, being just really candid, um, you know, this is 21st century problems by nature are really complex and touch a lot of different fields and sectors. So I think that this ability to cut across sectors and figure out ways to speak different languages and bring people together or to just be a generalist in practice is going to be ever more important because um, the machines can specialize, right? <laughs> but, but that's going to be our talent as humans to be able to, to see bigger and make those, those more abstract connections. Um, but you know, in, in that sense, I think every one of, of us uh, has had to deal with that. But you, you know, Clay, you may have just hit on an area where we need to think more about how we're training people to deal with that. Um, you know, I, I think across our skill series, and I don't think we've got anything specific, even though it does touch all of our work. You know, it's something that I think the fellows do a great job of handling and kind of self-teaching. But I don't think there's anything that we specifically talk about, is there? You guys all sort of figure that one out for yourselves. Yeah, I, I was going to say, to me, it, it's just been an, evol it's been an evolving process. I, I think a lot of people do come at it with a natural, like to get mm -hmm. to the point where To get to at, this place. I yeah. think they're very, you know, they have to get through a fairly rigorous process. So I think people are coming at it with a, a maybe a, a natural uh, proclivity towards that. Um, for me, I, I it's something I noticed because like, I'm doing so much, so much code switching between like arts and military, conservative, liberal. I mean, we do programming in Hampton Roads, which is like the birthplace of slavery in the United States. So racial lines, um, and it, for me, I, like I've thought about it a lot, and it, I think for me, it comes from my childhood. Like I grew up in, uh, I grew up Jewish in a very anti-Semitic town, and I had to be both like the Jewish kids with my Jewish community and then, you know, someone who could fit in with the broader school. Uh, I grew up um, in a household that was extremely politically divided, so I have to talk to my dad. It was a very different thing to talk to my mom. Um, and, I, and I grew up, you know, you know working at a, in an intersectional area in North Jersey where, you know, some of my friends had, like, blatantly racist parents and then like all of my basketball teammates, you know, were from areas that these people were racist against. So how do you kind of deal with that in your upbringing? I think that was very much helpful for me um, as I've kind of reflected on this in the past. Mm -hmm. I would like to say that, and obviously there is a long list of uh, wonderful things and trainings that have been given, and, and I could even show some examples. 
but I fear that the, the biggest thing is not really one of those things. It's more that when I am in the Halusian building and come across with fellows or talk to you know people, you just start to believe you can really do it. And, and you go out and it's impossible and it's so hard and you get burnt out and you go there and you start to believe again, like, no, this is actually really possible. And, and then you go to an organization where everybody's, uh, we can't, and then, you know, you carry that sort of a halusion, optimism or whatever. And then it's a gift to the, the, the place. But I don't think it comes from me only. It's just that sort of a power of the space and community. And for me, that was really mm. the, the biggest gift. Definitely to add to that, I think that um, you know everybody that comes to whatever projects in Halcyon already has a passion or a charge. Like you know, your experience was based on your time being in the hospital. My experience came from like growing up in um, South Carolina and having a very impassioned response to my own personal education narrative. So I think that Halcyon has a really good job of being able to discern that because at the end of the day, there really is no training for this type of stuff that we're doing because it is incredibly groundbreaking. And I think anyone who would ever say that you can train someone to be able to take on something like this would be you know, a snake oil salesman because the kind of passion and challenge and fortitude and infrastructure you need to take on larger systems like this. Um, I don't think that any book or any motivation talk can do that. You have to have that already. And then Halcyon does that thing where they recognize the people that have that, and then they create this like convenient force field. Mm -hmm. So this person can then go out in the community and then start doing this work. Because that's all I think that everyone really needs is that infrastructure, is that platform, is that kind of force field. And you can say, go ahead, go forth, and do this type of work. So we're not going to create that class, Clay. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody over here. Thanks. Um, I really appreciated your brief talk about the three buckets and um, space, access, and community uh, early on, just to give us a sense of what it was all about. And I really particularly appreciated that you called out space as being both the obvious physical space, but also that, that mental that space. Uh, yeah. space you're creating. Um, so, as somebody who loves the concept, but also would love um, as many people as possible to be yeah. experienced, to yeah. be able to experience something like this, um, I was just thinking, geez, how could you do this out, you know, in, in real life, so to speak, uh, for folks who are still doing their own thing and, and, and can't necessarily take that break, because um, you did talk about it as being a pretty unique mm -hmm. privilege, really. Um, and access is clear, right? I mean, that's something I think we all know how to build network and build access. And, uh, and community, I think, you know, I see this as all a big Venn diagram. So community can be created in part by creating that space in the first place. But space you can, particularly. You can seek your own community, right? Yeah. And anyone's welcome to come to our place, like, and tap into that community. Um, you know, I, I think... Uh, the values of Halcyon, to sort of like get into this with you, and we can go, hang on some mic because maybe we make this more of a conversation. The values are, are, are nimbleness, risk tolerance, optimism. Um, uh, I always forget them. Nicole, do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> nimbleness, op optimism, risk tolerance, and like a nurturingness and a humility, right? And so we use those as filters mm -hmm. to try and guide how, what we create. So I think. For, for people trying to replicate that, thinking about what are the values of the space that they want around them, and then using those as filters for choices is, is a really great place to begin. Um, you know, I, I also personally, and I think that every one of these guys does this by nature, when I get really stressed, you know, and, and you can talk about self-care and how you need to meditate and blah, 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 you know, <laughs> which is very important. But uh, personally for me, when I get stressed about the size of the things that we're trying to do and the challenges, the nature of the challenges, I go right to service. I learned this from one of my amazing board members, Michelle Freeman. You, you just retreat to service, right? How can you help someone? Take 5% of your time in a day 
and just help someone, make a connection for someone, check in with someone who you, you know needs to hear from you, and don't expect anything to come from it. And I have just found that if that is like part of my practice, it just starts to emanate. And I don't just do it for fellows, but like anybody. And it, it, there's something about that when you ask sort of like, how do you create this out in the world? There's something about that I think that does it. If imagine if we were all to like take five percent of our human time and think about mm -hmm. somebody else and what we can do for them. So I think that's that's something. I don't know if you guys want to talk about that or anything else that you think about in terms of how do you extend this. I wanted to say that um, that DC service champ. So Phil is an amazing designer, community organizer, and I actually participated the the weekend program three days of a like a design service hackathon and you are you know one of the, the people to organize something like that was for me was a really nurturing space that actually prepared me for this experience it continues to be a big part of uh, my experience too and in a way you're already you know doing that and and that's uh, like an example i i believe yes Oh shucks. <laughs> <laughs> was that was that part of your question? Yeah. So kind of how did I call it? I heard uh, you know you're creating a set of shared values uh, up front. You're creating a set of uh, rules for engagement with each other, so that you know you create a degree of safety and allowing uh, this uh, vulnerability with each other, both mm. in your oh, yeah, coach huge. and with your service to yeah. each other. Yeah. Um, so it's a thank you. Another question right here, and then down here afterwards. Hi, my name is Andres Marquez Lara. I'm founder and passion catalyst at Promethean Community. And uh, first of all, thank you. I mean, hey, I think Andres, just, how are hey, you? Kate, I good to see you. Uh, it's just so inspiring as a fellow social entrepreneur and artist, just like having places like Halcyon bring this amazing talent. It's easy for us in the community that, that are so trying to do hard work to point to these organizations saying, hey, we're not the lone nut. Like, there are people there. There are many of us. There's a whole community of us. And I think, you know, as you, as you, as you all know, like, we all have networks. And uh, the term I use is performance activists. They're communities of performance activists, people using art to change the world. But many of, of them, until you're able to become a social entrepreneur and start making money of that, you have a nine to five. And you have to work the nine to five. And in some ways, I'm, I'm, I would like to ask you, Kate, uh, from your perspective, because in some ways, I think there's a supply of talented, amazing artists all over the world that have the skill set. And that I think that the accelerators and incubators like Halcyon and others do a great job in preparing them to go out into the world. Mm -hmm. However, I'm more interested in the demand side, in the grant makers, the people that have, with wealth, the ones that are creating opportunities for, uh, they have a grant for a particular project. The mindset that it takes to fund this kind of initiative, the thorny progress, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. it's, it's a particular type of mindset. So I'm curious, from your perspective, what is Halcyon doing, or how are they supporting this shift in mindset in philanthropy and grant makers to be able to tolerate the risk yeah. and the long-term progress that this takes? Doing six months of research at a hospital just to find out the right progress, most traditional you know, philanthropists who are like, you know, will not give you that much time unless you have some sort of previous experience or a solution that has been proven. But if you're innovating, oftentimes you don't have the proof of concept. So I'm just curious to get yeah. your perspective I'll on that. I'll try not to get on a soapbox, because I, I hear you, mm. and I, I, I feel very strongly about this personally. Um, you know, philanthropic dollars are tax-deferred money, right? Personally, to me, the, the government is the right institution to handle things that are proven. You, they, they know how to build roads. We figured that part out for ourselves. They, you know, need some help with education, but, you know, they, sure. they run that, you know, and as they should. But philanthropy is meant to be challenge grants. It's meant to be risk taking. It's meant to be trying to find the solutions that we don't know how to do yet. Um, and I think if you're going to have that money taken out of the tax system, then you should be taking risks with it. That should be risk money. Mm. And um, you know, I, do, I agree with you, it's frustrating the amount of people that are willing to, to play a little harder with that. And, and back things that aren't necessarily proven yet. Um, it's not, particularly with the arts, it's not easy to apply metrics and outcomes. And when you do, you sometimes um, uh, step into some really tricky ground um, where you start measuring for things that, you know, either you're not measuring for really, 
or um, maybe that's really not the thing that... Actually, I'm going to hand over to Sam. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about that, because that's a pitfall that you've been so mindful about. Yeah, um, so just, just for brief context, uh, in the veteran military space, one of the big challenges we have uh, folks who are talking about outcomes that don't match their interventions, right? So talking about uh, addressing uh, symptoms of PTSD with community-based arts classes, right? That's a community, non-clinical program talking about a clinical outcome. And we see a lot of mismatch with that. That's also an opportunity though, right? Because we're now in an inter because it's intersectional, um, we can, and I think that's why we're seeing so much interest in arts and health and you know arts in these different intersections because that's where we can bring in arts funders to, they also want to justify why they exist, right? And so if, if arts funders can say, well, we're not, you know, we're funding arts programming and it's improving the well-being of veterans or if it's helping uh, reduce recidivism, like that is something that allows us to bring arts funders to the table, but it also allows us as artists, or I'm not actually, I don't want to say as an artist, as someone who runs an arts organization, because I, I cannot on the stage with the next president of Juilliard uh, claim myself to be um, that. Um, I walked out of cats when I was seven, so that's my, um, but, uh, you know, you're also then able to tap into other buckets of funding. So like for us, you know, being able to tap into veterans funding, being able to tap into health funding, that allows us to build out our sustainability and grow what, you know, at our core, we, in a sense, we are a community arts organization. Um, and community arts organizations are very difficult to scale and we've been able to tap into that to start to expand it. Um, so I know I took that outcomes yeah, conversation and took it to the funding piece, but I think there is this um, opportunity, I would frame it, it's a challenge, but it is an opportunity to say, Yes, we're reaching, you know, we could talk, we could count outputs, you know, we could talk about how many people we're serving, we can talk about how the audience members are reached, but like how, how are those audience members' attitudes changed over time? Like how do we start to take those longer term perspectives um, with this programming? And, and I do think that's an opportunity to elevate arts funding, but also bring in new people. And take it like one step further, like moving from this like incredibly measurable space, which I also consider to be another problem with education is this idea like, you know, because we are essentially teaching to the test, mm -hmm. um, you know, and like we're not even thinking about these um, little people as like fully developed human beings. And, you know, like, you know, like what it means to be a responsible human being. And, and I feel like art does that work. So I don't really feel like with this project, I stand in any position to be able to put something measurable in front of someone. You know, because like creating a curriculum, obviously, like, you know, like, oh, five years of study and making sure that it's effective and anything like that. So one of the beauties of this project is like I can use my fine art practice to then fund, you know, this curriculum in a way that I don't have to engage that system because there isn't a precedent there. Um, you know, no one's going to jump at the opportunity to get behind a curriculum created by an artist, someone who, who's not from education or education policy. Even like, you know, you know, getting into this project, one of the things I realized that even teachers don't have that much um, impact on curriculum right now. Um, so like just considering like working around and I think like, you know, like being in an environment like where you're able to access different resources and then work that translation service and actually to support and maybe subvert the system that you're trying to dismount. Um, you know, actually could be even more effective. So it's like, I'm not even really looking for anyone to, you know, if anyone came and said, oh, I want to get behind this project, I would be suspect at first. Um, but there are a few organizations um, like Teaching for Change, who's just, I've, you know, had a relationship with uh, much longer before I started this project that I can trust that will help me to develop this project in a way that it's uh, possible. But I think like you will see that kind of dynamic through a lot of the work that happens at Halcyon, that people are going to have to find new um, non-traditional pathways to put our work in spaces um, that we can scale the effectiveness just because we're coming and, at it from And sometimes it's, it is so frontier, so idea stage that you know, we don't necessarily know what we're measuring yet. No idea. Right? Yeah, no, and no idea. and uh, yeah, I, I'm recalling actually a time in college in 19 and something um, mm -hmm. when I got into an argument with my macroeconomics professor because he was talking about GDP and the measurements required for economics. And I said, you know, but do we measure the, 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 the impact in terms of the number of trees that get cut down for mm -hmm. that? And this is now becoming like an acceptable thing to think about is sort of like the resource cost and measuring that in economically and, and measuring levels of human well-being and happiness along with, you know, our, our GDP and our profit, mm -hmm. other ways of thinking about profit and, and well-being. Um, but it, 
But then I was a lone voice in a very large amphitheater, and my professor was not pleased with me. So, you know, I think that just to also remember that collectively, we may not be measuring the right things. Exactly. That's a very useful observation, I think, that we may not be. Sorry, Yoko. No, sorry. To your point, and I also want to come back to your question quickly as well. Uh, Sam and I were just talking that about a year and a half ago, and he was like, oh, I'm going to this lunch thing with uh, Bill Drayton, who was the first person to come up with the term social entrepreneur. Would somebody want to come? And I was like, sure. <laughs> and, and that lunch of one hour and what I heard and what I learned stayed with me. And it was about that, the metric and... and, and and so this is not my idea. This is Mr. Bill Drayton <laughs> through you. He so talked. It's my idea. It's yours. <laughs> he talked about the importance of differentiating three areas: uh, direct service, that's a short-term, immediate outcome of your work. The second level is a behavior change. And the final level is a cultural change, a framework change. Mm -hmm. Tragedy happens when we try to measure the framework change using the metric of a direct service and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And I continue to use that like every week to talk to different stakeholders, to different hospital CEOs. And, and also we need to be proactive and creative to come up with the metrics from the beginning on our own so that we can do a storytelling later. And I realized that if I don't do it, no one can do it for us. Um, so I think that there is a bit of a proactiveness that, mm -hmm. that's required and we can all help each other. Mm -hmm. To your earlier, earlier question, half of what I do is sort of a grant-funded outcome is a donation to commons type of work. And half of what we do, we try to frame it as consulting service. So we get revenue from the institutions that we help. The first project we did, um, and I know it's recorded, so I have to be careful what I say. Oh, we, <laughs> we did not get a permission. We just did the work with people who are willing to help. I had a physician who came to me. I make enough money. I just believe in this, and I want to help. Can I do something? I had six volunteers, and we just did the research. And we got media coverage. And that kind of a in kind of a traveled back to the institution, and now they got the positive coverage. They had to put the funding to actually make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of what I do is like that, you know, I because it was impossible, right? And and we had to do so. It's guerrilla philanthropy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's entrepreneurship. That's awesome. That's right. Uh, we had one more down here, I think, and actually right there. We can go quick ones. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Rimi Basu Sambrida. Um, I run uh, Shakti Foundation for Arts and Culture dedicated to um, preserving unity and diversity, so immigrant inclusion. Um, I feel so strongly about the work that is being done at Halcyon. And um, you know, for me, like everything about the mission and the values that you're talking about up here is like a resounding yes. Um, and it's really gratifying to see so many other people that also seem to have these same values because in this work, a lot of the times the people that I'm deal dealing with don't necessarily share um, the passion for connection and for empathy and for collaboration between diverse groups. So, um, but it's also a little disheartening because I realized that, you know, there's, there's only going to be three fellows. I also applied eight, last... Eight, eight artists and eight entrepreneurs. Just okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, and I actually applied last year and I didn't know any of you guys then, but I just happened to find it online and I was like, oh, this looks like completely perfect for me. Um, 
and then I didn't get it, and um, I didn't really receive feedback either on you know what I could have changed. Well, this is getting rapidly awkward. Mm. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm asking really is, um, you know, I think a lot of people in here, um, and a lot, there are a lot of artists out there who really feel strongly about this. And how? What are some ways that we can engage with Halcyon? Um, if we, if we don't get the fellowship, you yeah, know, how I is really the best appreciate the question. And we have had many people apply more than once, and some of them do eventually get in. So I encourage that. I also apologize that you didn't get feedback. But it's something we've thought about a lot. We get you know 400 applications for eight spots, and for my team to be able to give substantive, thoughtful feedback to every person is pretty impossible. So we don't unless we can do it well, we don't do it. And so that's the reason, just so that you're aware. Um, but we, so at the Arts Lab, we have monthly open studios. Um, so the, the whole of the Arts Lab opens up and people are welcome to join us. We have other events there as well. Um, and we are very interested in building a bigger community of like-minded, like-valued people, and unlike-minded, unlike-valued yeah. people um, to, to come and, and be in that space. Um, and uh, our fellows are really always very interested to sort of like meet and collaborate with other people. Um, so, so it's a couple of things. I encourage you to apply again always. And, and I, I think, uh, you know, both at the incubator and the arts lab, we, we hope always that people will come, come and be with us. So is it possible to just um, come and work there or do you have specific events? Specific yeah. events. Um, we're also this June. Uh, we're, we're doing a big festival, um, and this is our effort to, to sort of take these um, goals of creativity and compassion out to a wider audience. It's called By the People. It's going to be in Washington D.C. Um, June 21st through 24th, right before Aspen. Um, and uh, uh, basically, we're we're interested in creating a festival that celebrates. Um, empathy and connection and and creates opportunities for people to do that and connect through art and dialogue um, that is free and inclusive to all. Um, there's a couple of tickets for performances, but everything else is going to be wide open and free. Uh, we're working with the Smithsonian. They've given us the Arts and Industries Building, and we're working with the team there to curate that space mindfully. Um, the Arc, Union Market, National Cathedral, and Walter Reed are the other sites, uh, north, south, east, and west, um, where we're working with artists and performers. Uh, there's a group called Art Tech House that's creating a, um, an augmented reality app so that you can sort of like it, um, experience art on a virtual level as well and find it a la Pokemon Go art style. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an open call for digital artists for that right now. So we wanted to make that for anyone who might want to um, uh, give that a try. Um, and we're working, as I mentioned, around um, creating spaces for, for, for dialogue with the really the goal of empathy in mind. You know, how can we use this festival to remind everybody in this very fractious time that we are actually united and unified and we share founding principles and, um, uh, and just come together for something positive? We have to stop, but I thought that was a perfect place to think of how wide this effort is going. When you think about these individuals and the other fellows uh, and the other incubatees, uh, who are you know getting these these opportunities to grow under Halcyon and then take it to that next step in June uh, with by the people? Uh, really, congratulations on Halcyon! Congratulations Thank to you. all three of you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Guys are doing crazy things. <laughs> so amazing.